Welcome to the Mother May I Podcast with Frank and Irene and Strong Island Entertainment. Gee, I hope I didn't make a mistake with these two. They promised me they'd bring in some really good guests. Well, anyway, here's Frank and Irene. Welcome to Mother May I Podcast with Frank and Irene. I'm Irene, and that is the very handsome Mr. Frank Conniff. Hello, Frankie. Hey, how you doing? I'm hey. doing good, actually. Okay. I am doing good. How's the, I was just asking you where Millie was because I always like to see. Ah, yeah. oh, there she is. She's making an appearance. Millie is making an appearance. Everybody hey. who's listening to this hey, podcast. Hi, she is reflecting, it looks like. Frank's cat, Millie, is just looking out the window, almost like she's reflecting on something, Frank. Yeah. Ruminating. She, I, I took her to the vet uh, last week just for a checkup. Yeah. And she got a good report. Oh, and, good. And, um, uh, and the, the vet, when I was talking to her on the phone, she said, uh, Millie was being such a sweetheart. And that's the, the, the trouble with Millie is... Nobody ever gets to see her when they come over. Right. And they don't, and she really is such a sweet cat, but nobody except me uh, and, the, and a veterinarian ever gets to experience that. Right. They don't get to experience it. I wish I could say that I get to experience yeah. it. For a while there, I thought she was like George Glass. Remember that episode from the Brady Bunch? It was mm -hmm. Millie this and Millie that, but every time I came over, I could never find Millie. Yeah, she, uh, she, she's very shy. She's and, shy. Uh, she doesn't know that she's done. <laughs> I love that, Millie, and you can't see this because it's a podcast, but Frank's cat, absolutely, even when she's being seen, will never directly address the camera. She's the no, complete no. opposite of uh, me and you, Frank. She is. She's not the publicity whore that we are. She's not the narcissistic whores that we oh. are. Yeah, not at all. So, Frank, I can't believe it, but um, did I read this correctly? But we are actually need proof of vaccination now in the city, right? Is this true? I just, went, I just went to the website and got my and got the app with the um, uh, with the the vaccination passport or whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, it's really simple to get. Right. If, if you have your card with yeah. your information about the date that you got. Right. The vaccine and where you no, not even where you got it, just your, your zip code mm -hmm. and um, and um, the date that you got your last vax and also yeah. um, uh, one other thing I forget, very, very uh, uh, simple thing. And then and then it, 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 I, it just uh, you download the app and it's uh, it's really easy to get. It's almost like it really finds you. Okay, so wait. Oh for yeah, it. you so, actually. You, I was going to say you tell them which vaccine you got, like Pfizer or which. Okay, so you do the zip code and which vaccine. So what if I have just a picture of my vaccination card? That's just as good, right? Uh, probably, yeah. I'm guessing. I'm yeah. guessing that. Uh, um, and and also, not that you need to that you should depend on this, but. My guess is that all of the indoor venues and everything are going to be a little lax about this whole thing. I think they're going to be lax the, too. The two shows I've done already, which was yeah. at Little Field and at Stand Up New York, in the ad, they both said, must have proof of vaccination to get mm -hmm. in. And, and they didn't check anybody for that. They didn't check anybody. Uh, Personally, Frank, I wouldn't mind it because then I would be, be with an audience that I could talk about the yeah, essence of not getting good, vaccinated. The good thing for them to yeah. check up on all that. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I mean, the fact that I was able to download it really easily is proof that it's easy because if I can do it, anyone can. No, Frank, if I can do it, anybody can. And we'll, we'll, okay. we'll follow up on the next show. What kills me is that a lot of people have an issue with this whole vaccination. A lot of those people that have an issue about, um, having this, uh, mandate that you have to proof of vaccination are the same people that uh, try to tell women what to do with their bodies. I'm not saying all of them, but largely a, a large portion of these same people that don't like to be told to do what with their bodies are the same, very same people that are uh, pro-choice, which of course, you consider, you know, I mean, pro-life, sorry, not pro-choice. you consider the suffering and what people have had to go, go through in the course of human history mm -hmm. and now, we're being asked to get a couple of shots mm -hmm. to put a piece of cloth over the bottom part of our face. Mm -hmm. And people are acting like uh, they're the most oppressed people of all time. I mean, people have just mm -hmm. got to quit being such fucking babies mm -hmm. and just do these simple things 
that will make things better for everyone, you know. Exactly. So but that we people, can move people, on. People dying mm -hmm. of COVID is part of the Republican political strategy. And yep, uh, exactly. I wish, I wish I was making that up, but it's the truth. It is the truth. And you know what? Like I said, these people that are pro-life are not pro-life when it comes to a woman's choice. They're not pro-life when it comes to the vaccination. And I'm saying this, I'm not saying every single one, but I'm saying a large people that are the type of people that are against a woman having the right to choose what she does with her body are the same kind of people that are refusing to get the vaccination anyway. Uh, we, we're going to just fire up this show, Frank, cause I'm so excited. One of my favorite, uh, horror directors and filmmakers has always been Clive Barker. And today we have none other than Simon Bamford from Hellraiser. I'm sorry, Hellraiser. He played the, uh, Butterball Cenobite, this man. Oh my God. And Mr. Jason oh, no. Bullock, who is one of my favorite people is also here to join us. Thank you for joining us. No, no. <laughs> he has, I he can't has, believe the it. Hell, the Hellraiser hell Rubik's Cube. That I know, I was going to say. It. You know what it was? I, Frank, you always beat me to the punch. I hate you sometimes, but I love you. I was going to say, this gave me an intimate, <laughs> an infinite fear of the Rubik's Cube after watching this. I said the same thing. I, I, oh, my God. Look at you guys. I, I feel left out. And you all came. That's amazing. That's I don't amazing. Think the sexual innuendo 1970s kind of came way. I mean, just in of that, you arrived on my Zoom call. <laughs> my Simon, it's... Your, Jason, look, mine twists. Uh, mine mine twists. Now, mine it's a podcast, so we can't really see what's going on except for this Zoom. And uh, I just want to be clear on that. But he's holding the, the what is that called? The box? Um, the puzzle the box. box. It's called the Lament Configuration. He oh. knows better than I do. Oh, the Lament yeah. Configuration, because I don't remember them ever really specifying what no. that is. Now, Simon, when right before we were um, backstage or whatever you want to call it, back Zoom stage, and we were talking, I was uh, thinking, I was noticing how funny you are as a person. And when you were portraying the Cenobite, I feel like the Cenobite, your Butterball Cenobite was also very comical. Was that like a, a choice that you made as an actor or was that in the character description for your character? No, I don't think it was. I mean, apart from having a huge vagina in my stomach. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think humor ever came into to any of the uh, descriptions in Hellraiser, which is a shame, yeah. really, because yeah. Clive's got a great sense of humor. Uh -huh. But no, 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 no. But I don't know, Simon. I felt like your character, the Cenobite, was very, Butterball Cenobite, was very comical, the way he was, the way he looked and the way he was taking off his sunglasses and putting them back on. I thought he was, he reminded me of, like, Freddy Krueger or something. There was that, <laughs> that campy, um, uh, that, that, that comical was, edge. That famous comedy character, Freddy Krueger. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Freddy Krueger was masking before anyone else was, so don't put him down. <laughs> so did you catch that too, Jason? Do you see what I'm saying with his character in how? Oh yeah, he did the tongue. The tongue thing was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. The, the tongue thing only came because the the face wouldn't move at all, and the only thing I could get out of my head, but actually of me that you see is my tongue. So yeah, I, I, I there was a lot of tongue action. So I suppose There's that a lot was of tongue action. <laughs> Do you get and, asked and to do that? A, and well, and I, I thought when you went to, to hell that you, you know, obesity, you could at least overcome obesity, but no, you were an obese Cenobite for those of uh, who are unfamiliar with uh, Hellraiser. Um, how was it working with the master of horror, Mr. Clive Barker? It was lovely. Clive is an absolute lovely, lovely chap. And he's one of these wonderful, warm characters because he's a writer. He's really interested in everybody he meets because he knows that, like you, Frank, everybody he meets has a story and has a character that he can kind of lock away and take a bit of this and a little bit of that and, and use it for later, later characters. Do you do that, Frank? Uh, yeah, I, you know, um, <laughs> absolutely. Like everything you observe, uh, in your life is the potential to be something that, that you can uh, incorporate in your writing. Um, you, you know, Nora, Nora Ephron had a quote that her mother, who was also a writer, actually said was that everything is copy. You know, in other words, everything that happens to you 
is uh, potential for something for you to write about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because Clyde is so genuinely interested in people, it, it makes him, because, because he has that passion for writing, he's genuinely interested in everybody he meets and he wants to find out everything about them. So he's, he's a lovely person to work with. He's a lovely person to meet generally. Wow. Didn't you all do theater together too before Hellraiser? Say again, sorry? Didn't you all do theater together before Hellraiser? Yes, I, I, I worked with Clive um, in Fringe Theater in London. Um, wow. With um, Doug, Doug Bradley, Pinhead. Um, he was in the Fringe Company too. And wow. I, I'm was, sorry, this is amazing. It almost reminds me of like Goodfellas and all the De Niro films that when you, you know, in like comics, as comics, we, we start together and we kind of help each other out mostly um, throughout our careers. That was for Frank. <laughs> so so you you start to work together that's amazing now did so you guys also obviously that's the connection that brought you guys all together to do this right yes that's yeah. right yeah um we we did fringe theater and like most fringe theater we didn't make any money from it and um it was supposed to be profit share but all the profit was going back into these wackier ideas that clive was having on how to create a skinned character on stage and and how to make severed heads and all sorts of things so we never made any money from it that's and then we all we all wanted to be actors, professional actors, and we thought, well, the only way we can do this is to actually disband the company and, and go away and, and do more commercial type theatre, which we did. Um, and then Clive was doing very well and had his Books of Blood made into short stories and published. And I rang him about two years later just to see what he was up to. And he said, oh, I've just had these two screenplays made into films, but I wasn't very happy with the way that they were dealt with. And I persuaded the production company to let me direct and write the next one. And that was Hellraiser. And he said, do you want to play a monster in my horror film? And I went, yeah, that'd be nice. And so, you well. became iconic after that. I know well. you have action figures and you have a cult following a little bit like Mr. Conniff over here from Mystery Science Theater 3000. So uh, are you, you, do you do the circuit? Like do you go to these horror um, cons, whatever you call them or Comic Con? Yeah, I do. And it's taken me all over the world, which has been crazy, crazy, crazy. Because to be honest, really, all I did in Hellraiser was put on a big fat suit and um, a head couldn't move. And the only part of it I could get out was my tongue. I was completely blind, so I couldn't actually even hit a mark on set. Um, they had to like point me in the right direction and then I'd shuffle forward till I could feel something on my feet. So there was no real acting involved. So the fact I'm here um, 30 five years later, still talking about it. And like you say, I get invited all over the world. I'm coming to America, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I'm coming to America in October. Oh, if, the border, if the borders are open to us, us Brits, um, to Fort, Fort Wayne. Well, they're open to you to come to us, but not the other way around. We're, we're still banned from visiting well, they, they you. Wanna, they want to get rid of us, so they're ready. Yeah. <laughs> Can you blame uh, but them? I, I'm curious, um, does anybody, uh, the, any of the fans at the uh, comic cons and horror cons, do they ever come and do cosplay as your character? Yeah, yeah, they do. Yes, uh, um, there's quite a few butterballs come along. I've, I've seen quite a few butterball tattoos on people, mm. which I've signed various parts of people's anatomy, which can be quite fun. <laughs> Those yeah. guys probably get a lot of puss on the side. I'm pretty sure of it. Mm? A lot of pussy magnets. Butterballettes. Yeah. <laughs> I, if any time I can find anyone at a convention with a vagina in their stomach, I'm all over. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, I wanna I wanna thank Jason because he's the he's the connector here and he's awesome. And Jason and I both love la la love. love horror films and when he mentioned oh my god hellraiser i was like what i couldn't believe it now jason how did you guys meet how did you meet uh, each I other used, i used to run a comedy club in the crown plaza hotel where monster mania comes called rascals <laughs> and um i was like a kid to candy store when they came in because i was a horror nut and the ashley lawrence who plays kirsty and barbie wilde who was female cenobite in Hellraiser 2 came in and asked me if there's a Walmart and I drove them to Walmart because they said where they live they've never seen an actual Walmart so I was honored to show them the place where the real Cenobites live 
Right, and where people <laughs> buy guns as well. Then, oh no, they don't. They do. Wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, that, yeah no, that's no, what we've no, no Walmart. That. Yeah, in, in yeah, the that's... Walmart is considered very exotic and very special. <laughs> I well, heard then you'll that, really uh, be I, impressed with Costco, sweetie. That'll really cream your I, I heard that, uh, that Clive Barker wrote a horror story that took place there. Hell Greeter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so that, that night we saw, I saw Ashley. I think you guys were hanging out in the lobby of the hotel and we started talking. I was with a friend and you connected with my friend Lindsay and we were talking about serial killers and... You, we just we just bonded over serial killers and horror. They have serial a way killer. of bringing people together. <laughs> yep, yep. That's it, what no brings matter how people many pieces, together. Yes. Death and murder, as we've seen with the <laughs> pandemic. Um, Simon, I mean, what was it like actually being in that costume for all that time on set, too? That didn't look like the most comfortable, I must admit. You know, the costume wasn't too bad because I had this kind of six-inch gash in my stomach. Uh, <laughs> That Frank is very attracted to. <laughs> and could yeah. fill it with no problem, P.S., by the way. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, is, uh, the echo would be incredible, but never mind. <laughs> I didn't have to say it twice. They used to fill it with, um, they didn't, these days they have a special goo in Hollywood that they use for, for making people look slimy and gloopy and everything. Mm -hmm. But it, back in those days, they didn't. So they used to fill it fill my gash before every take <laughs> KY jelly. So it was almost a premonition, Frank. I know. They, <laughs> they actually asked to borrow my supply when it was happening. <laughs> Oh, here it is. When Frank, when we're having talk like this, I always say to Frank, Frank's hands where I can see them. Hands oh, where I can see them, Mr. Conniff. Oh my God. So this is interesting. I love horror. I mean, Frank loves horror. I maybe not as much as Jason and I. We absolutely love horror. But I was wondering, like, did you grow up loving horror? Like, and who some of your favorite like uh, directors and writers in horror were? Uh, well, for me, yes. Um, I, I grew up in a tiny little village in England and um, we had a news agent and while all, all the other kind of teenage boys were trying to get to the top shelves to get their porno mags um, and, and Playboy, I was trying to get Fangoria magazine. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, I should have worn my Fangoria t-shirt today. I, I made the front cover one. My, 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 it was like I'd made it in the world. Yeah, but, really cover of Fangoria. That little boy in that little village would have been so proud. <laughs> That's exciting. That but, really is exciting. That's amazing that you wanted to do this because often when we, you know, actually, I am um, Jason had Ashley. Um, I'm not going to even try to remember her last name, but she was Sorry. in the movie The Human Centipede, which was like. A, oh no, Ashley Williams. Like, yeah. Ashley Williams. And, you know, she was saying, I asked her if a uh, horror actually typecasted her and ruined her career. And she said it kind of did. Do you feel that it had that effect on your acting career or, or do you even care? Because it seems like you love doing horror. Um, no, I, yes, I do love doing horror. Um, I think you have a good laugh. The, the, the early days were, were not quite so good. Like the Hellraiser days, the, the worst bit was the head because it was I was blind. There were no eye holes in it. There were no ear holes in it. It was three inches thick. There was no nose hole in it. So how so, are you breathing? A mouth hole? Through, well, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> mouth hole. Did, did, have, have did you ever get to a point where you I spend so much time? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Jason. So did you ever get to a point where you spent so much time in that costume that you said to yourself, damn it, I'm a trained Shakespearean actor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes they would put us like we would be in makeup at 3 a.m. Sometimes we would be super glued with surgical super glue into the makeups and the costumes by six, seven in the morning. And then all the other actors would turn up and you'd smell this lovely fried cooked breakfast around you. But they said, no, 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 that might melt the glue that's attached to you. So you can have an orange juice. Um, and then sometimes we'd sit there till eight o'clock at night and they wouldn't actually get to us. Oh, and we were yeah. sat there in this sensory, de for me, a sensory deprivation. I couldn't see, I couldn't hear, I couldn't breathe through my nose. I couldn't talk to anybody else because I've got false teeth. Oh my God. That's like being oh. buried alive as far as I'm concerned, Frank. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, um, uh, uh, that's a scary thing. I, but, but you know what, I, when you were mentioning Shakespeare, I was gonna say that in some ways it, it's, it isn't really, 
that big of a leap from Shakespeare to horror, right? Because Shakespeare has witches and ghosts and, and all kinds yeah. of that stuff in his work. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Shakespeare is kind of uh, the, the leader for all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I, 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 since then, things have been much easier. I, I actually did the complete works. There's a comedy play called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare Abridged. Oh, I yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I did that um, on an international tour, which was great fun. So I got to play Ophelia, which was very nice. Uh, great story. I, I was playing in um, Egypt um, and the the prince of Egypt, I didn't even know there was a prince of Egypt, was there. <laughs> the audience and um, my character started in the audience um, and they it was dinner theatre so they'd all had this lovely lavish banquet and I didn't want to be there because I was too nervous so just before we started doing the play I swapped with the director who'd been sitting at this top table in this big banquet room and sat down and this character leant over and said uh, oh you're 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 new at the table you aren't here are you are you one of the actors <laughs> and I well, if I had to tell you that, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> and everybody else at the table, as one, went... <gasps> <Wow>. Silence! <laughs> and thankfully, this chap laughed and went, oh, oh, killing seems a little extreme. Maybe you could just cut out my tongue. I went, yes, I could do that. Anyway, turned out at the interval, the director came rushing back and said, you threatened to kill the Prince of Egypt. To his oh, oh, so oh, there we go. That was the gasp. And oh, he, yes. what he wants yeah. to he's willing he's willing to part with his tongue, I guess, huh? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's the yeah. one body part he's willing to to part with. Um, Simon, so you've been working a lot. You said that you're acting, you've been busy for that. So what kind of stuff are you working on? Can you talk about it? Funnily enough, I've been doing some horror films. Oh, Yes, so um, I've just been done the first film um, out on set since lockdown, which has been fantastic. It was interesting because everybody has to wear masks um, up until the take, and then we can all take them off, which seems a bit crazy because then we all take them off and <laughs> we all breathe the same air and then we all put them back on again. But it was fun. Yes, so it's a film called Mo Mosaic, and I got to play my first detective, which is why I've got no hair at the moment because I. So yeah, I was Detective Foley. It was quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> a detective, somebody quite straight. As you probably kind of worked out already, I'm quite a character actor. So <laughs> me playing something straight like that has been quite interesting. Um, but no, it was fun. And um, I got spoilers. Can I do spoilers? Yeah. Oh, no, Stay Frank hates spoilers. That's, that's not up to us. I think it's up to the filmmakers. OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the filmmakers would get very upset, and then they then you really would turn into a, a butterball. They'd send you right straight to hell, sweetie. Oh, I really yeah. forgot about Nightbreed. Oh yeah, Nightbreed. That's another another Clive Barker thing, right? Yeah, yeah. you got that to show your wrong. face in that one. I did I, again. I look very much like this actually, but yes. So I think Clive's thank you for doing two Hellraiser films and all that shitty makeup was to uh, he gave me Nightbreed where I had no makeup. Um, I had a false tattoo, um, a false nipple, in which a tattoo <laughs> glued because their mother, the, the, um, uh, I had a medal pinned to my nipple and that got ripped off in one scene. <laughs> wow, well, they just, you, your vagina and the stomach for one, nipple piercings <laughs> in the other, they're just, they're, they're going for it with you. I mean, I'm just a sexy beast, what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> you oh. are a sexy beast. So I, I, I wore a nipple clamp in a movie, but I can't tell you the movie, what the movie is. <laughs> <laughs> so as comics, loving horror, I always saw the uh, parallel between comedy and horror, too, because I feel like good horror always has to have that element of surprise at the end. You can't see the scare coming, just like you can't see the laugh coming. And I think I, when I first saw Hellraiser years ago, I was literally fucking terrified because if I had to picture what hell looked like and what goes on in hell, it would be Hellraiser. <laughs> Being ripped yeah. apart by these demons, right? Uh, yeah. You never saw 27 dresses, did you? No, I, <laughs> I never have. But I'm guessing that Clive Barker was probably born and raised a Catholic. Am I right? You're very, very astute. Yes, he was born and <laughs> 
Catholic. And you know, pretty much every piece of his work, you will find um, throwbacks to that. You will find references to to, to all of those. So yeah, uh, there, there's 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 always seems to be a removal man. I can't quite work that one out in all of his films. Right. Um, and always religion. Um, right. that, that, my biggest clue was the gash in your stomach. You know, <laughs> nothing about masturbation, though. So I was sorely disappointed. But the, you were blind, so that helps a lot. <laughs> and we were actually, um, the, the Cenobites are actually the order of the gash. That is actually the, our, our, our official name. I'm not making that up. That was, that was Irene's to- band name in, in high school, too. <laughs> Well, you know what, Jason? If it's not, it's gonna be. I'm gonna join a band just so I can call it there, that because I fucking love it. Um, it's almost as good as Frank's stiff upper clit for my next album. Frank, <laughs> that's that, that. I don't think that could ever be topped. Um, so Simon, so you did Hellraiser one, Hellraiser two. Now I forget what happened because uh, I have these memory lapses. But did did your did this the Senate bike can't die? They're undying. So what happened? Why didn't he bring you on to the other Hellraisers? Because production moved over to LA. <laughs> so yeah. we made the first two in London at the Pinewood. Oh well, the first one was in Cricklewood Production Village. The second one was at Pinewood Studios. And then um, the third one, Clive moved over to LA and production moved over to LA. We always um, joked on set that we'd started the first move at Cricklewood movie in Cricklewood, the second was at Pinewood, the third one had to be in Hollywood. It just was a natural progression. Mm-hmm. And it was, but not with us. They well, managed it was, to get- it's definitely the national progression of the stages of hell. So you're going closer yeah. to the nucleus, that's for sure. With uh, LA. Wood, wood is a good, seeing as you've got the gas, you've got to have the wood as well, haven't you? It has to be in there somewhere. <laughs> it has to be in there somewhere. So now, um, so do you get to work with like all the people that you, are you still in contact with the people that you worked with and, and did theater with? Yeah, so um, the four Cenobites, so Barbie and Nick and Doug and I, we meet up, well, we used to meet up, Doug's now moved to the States, we used to meet up at Heathrow Airport. We'd, we'd live our ordinary little lives over here. Then we'd meet up at Heathrow Airport and then we'd fly out to the States and, and we'd be picked up in a stretch limo and taken to a lovely convention and treated like royalty. Um, and fawned over and hit upon and all sorts of wonderful things. And then we'd fly back and go back to our normal little lives. So it was kind of, it, it was a nice way of having celebrity that you can kind of turn on and turn off. Because I think that's all the exactly, time- That's exactly what I experience. I, I go into a convention center, I'm a huge star. The minute I walk out of it, I'm just a regular guy that, you know, have to Never wait in line for the airplane and everything, you know. I think I, you're an icon. Um, Frank, you are. There's nothing normal but about only, Frank. But, but my iconness is all based on uh, square footage. It's where I am. <laughs> if uh, the minute I walk out of the convention center, uh, I, my stardom is gone until I go back in again. What What's the name of that horror I, iconic horror um, actress who wears all the blacks and has got the very big bazoos? Oh, uh, Elvira. Elvira or. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Elvira, 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 yeah. So Elvira, I see at a lot of conventions over in the states, and then a little bit later at the airport, you'll see the actress who plays Elvira, and mm-hmm. she does exactly the same. She doesn't look anything like Elvira. She's like a kind of your your warmest, loveliest mum, mm-hmm. uh, and she's there at the airport, and she's kind of gone back into being her. It's it's a good thing to be able to do. I think it must be awful to be famous all the time and to be to not be able to go anywhere without people. Yeah. Right. You know, I have a feeling that I was thinking about this, that gigantic celebrities um, now have a way maybe to go out in public anonymously is they can just always wear the mask. Mask, now. yeah. For the rest of, uh, even after the pandemic is over, they, they can, because I think people in masks are always going to be around from here on in, even after it's over. So that might be... Uh, you know, a way for uh, for Tom Cruise to go to Taco Bell, you know, and just hang out. Yeah, that's yeah I mean, exactly yeah, the- where he belongs. Taco Bell, no, Taco Bell is delicious. Tom Cruise should, doesn't even deserve Taco Bell. But <laughs> you're right, Frank. I think people can go incognito now, unless they're like, you know, had Betty Davis eyes, you know, like some very significant um, 
you know, beautiful Violet. I don't know what I'm going, where I'm going with this, like Liz Taylor, I'm sure they, but now with context, so I'm not making any sense. The point <laughs> is that you can go out, Frank, you're right. You, you, you saw Elizabeth Taylor, out. you'd be like, holy shit, Elizabeth Taylor is a zombie walking She's a Europe. zombie, she's coming back. <laughs> I can imagine you do get recognized, though. You've got a distinguishable look. Who, I think me? you could work right. with uh, oh, Elizabeth oh. Taylor in uh, Butterball <laughs> 8. That might be <laughs> <laughs> if, you guys could see, if you could see Simon right now, because this is, uh, again, this is a podcast. But the minute I met Simon, he's sitting in the, on a couch. And in the background, our producer didn't know that this was... Uh, a dummy because she's very realistic looking, but it's an old woman sleeping, just like a slob, just sitting there sleeping. <laughs> very real. Yeah, and, this, uh, this was oh one of the char characters I played. So this is Mrs. Wiltshire. So this is a prosthetic that they gave me after the last day's shooting. They gave me the prosthetic. And she's she's quite amazing. She's um I'm 85, you know, and I don't know why I got cast as an 85-year-old woman, but they did it anyway, and uh, it was great fun to do, Irene. <laughs> oh, like God. a twisted Mrs. Doubtfire. This is like yeah. a moment. It was so realistic. All I can say is, uh, yeah, sure, that's a prosthetic. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. She's just literally a head so that you have to put her on, right? Is that it? She goes over your head? Yeah, she spits, spits, spits the prosthetic. So there were bits, uh, because it was quite a large role. So there were lots of uh, movement in the face on that one. So it was good. Silicon. That's silicon, whereas Hellraiser Days, it was all um, latex. So That's right. Latex. Everybody has allergies, you know, and now silicon is not only good for women's breasts. Actually, they stopped doing that. They're using saline now. But silicon is very comfortable and flexible. Sounds like you really were in hell during her Hellraiser with not being able to see or breathe for eight hours. That sounds like, weren't you claustrophobic? That really does sound like terrifying. Yeah. I, I got very claustrophobic. There was a, there was one day I sat there and I just started to blubber. I started to cry because I thought I felt so sorry for myself. Because normally on a set, you know, you read the newspaper, you talk to other people, you read a book, you you joke, and I couldn't. I just could sit there with my bloody thoughts, thinking when's this going to end? And it was like being at the. Dentist. I can relate. <laughs> Go to the dentist, and sit in the chair, and you think this will be over soon. You just need to put up with it for a little bit longer. And don't say stop because you just have to go through it all again. And that's what Hellraiser was like. And when they offered me Hellraiser 2, I, I had some big thoughts about whether I really wanted to put myself through that for about 10 seconds. And then I went, yeah, I want to do another film. <laughs> sure, sure. So Were there jokes you made in the beginning when you put the costume on, you made jokes, and then it got old after another, after a half hour? And then you're sitting there thinking, uh, is there another joke I can make? Anything I could do in this freaking costume? Can you do the tongue thing? <laughs> so to get my tongue, because it was three inches thick, the latex, I had to get my tongue three inches out of the front of my face. And then you could just see that. So, yeah, I, I, I was seriously good at tongue sex by the end of Hellraiser. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So if you had to pick some of your other favorite, like there's there's Clive Barker and other like Wes Craven, like wh wh who are some of your favorite horror filmmakers? <laughs> so um, on Nightbreed, I got to work with David Cronenberg, who is one of my iconic mm. um, filmmakers. Oh, that's great. Um, and he was the sweetest gentlest of men really quietly spoke i think he's canadian really quietly spoken he had his family on set and just what the most was this three i'm sorry nightbreed. what, what no. was it nightbreed and with david, oh. Cron david cronenberg was acting in it oh okay okay cool um john carpenter oh um, wow great great, great. All of all of that ilk. Um, what about Stephen King? He's one of my favorites and I love him on Twitter. I just love him on Twitter. Oh yeah. I think it's wonderful. And you know what, if it wasn't for Stephen, Clive, we probably wouldn't, any of us know Clive Barker, the name Clive Barker. He was so generous to make that quote for when Clive was starting out that I have seen the future of horror and its name is Clive Barker. Wow. And that's, what, see, well, that's a very generous thing to do to another horror writer. But yeah. one of the, to the horror genre was because it was quite empty at the time. 
he realized there was a lot of space there for for writers to do well, so. Wow. Yeah, it is, it's like the retweet, right, Frank? Of uh, horror filmmakers have being endorsed like that. That's amazing. Because he is the king of horror, Stephen King, literally. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't know that story. That's amazing that he said that, like, about Clive Barker. Yeah, very generous. I'd love to, I'd love to work with Stephen King. I'd love to, I'd love to go to Maine, you yeah. know? And I saw, I saw his house when I was in Maine. Actually, I was in Maine doing a, uh, a convention, a, a Comic-Con in Portland, Maine, and uh, we drove by his house. Um, what does it look like? I, 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 my point is there's not a lot to do in Portland, Maine. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was cool, you know. What did it look like, Frank? His house. I didn't see it, but it was yeah. just behind a gate. I didn't really get that good a look at oh, it. Oh, it was behind a gate, of course. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, I, have, I, have a, I have a quick story about, about when I went to find Stephen King's house before GPS. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were following the, the directions that this girl in a coffee shop gave us from Bar Harbor to Bangor. And there's a, there's a, we we're driving down this two lane road. And there's a car crashed in the middle of the road. A group of people standing in the woods on the side, outside of the woods on the side of the street, watching. And there's paramedics behind the car that was crashed. Where there was the only car in the area too. One, it was a one car accident that somehow managed to crash into something in the middle of the road. And they're pulling a bloody woman out of the car, unconscious. It was horrifying. And I thought Stephen King writes this town, so <laughs> we. <laughs> We, we, we get closer and there's this gigantic old Lincoln and a, and a big cardboard sign on the back of the Lincoln that said, repent sinners all go to hell. And this tall old man with a uh, red sport coat was letting all these kids in the car. It was just a weird scene. And then we, uh, another block was the main street that Stephen King lives on. So we made a left and there was this house, big red Victorian with the gate was open, the big iron gate with the bats and the cobwebs. Oh, okay. So you got to peek inside, whereas Frank didn't get that luxury. I, I, um, I didn't even see the cobwebs. Was... <laughs> it was like engraved in the fence, the steel fence. <laughs> I, I it, must, have... it, it must feel great for Stephen King to know that everybody is looking for his house. And, you know. <laughs> I know that's horror in itself. Yeah. yeah. Itself. Well, he kind of he kind of went there as a concept in the book Misery. You know, that was like about a crazy thing. Oh. You know. One of my favorite yeah. horror films of all time. And for a horror film to win an Oscar, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And she won an Oscar for that. Kathy uh, yeah, made it great. an Oscar. It great. I she think the that. only horror movie to win Best Picture, correct me if I'm wrong, is probably Silence of the Lambs, right? I think you're right. I think you're right, too, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm not, but, but it was a, a great horror film too. And I'm sure the birds did a little something too without yeah, the, well, the birds, the birds was very six, but Hitchcock never got an Oscar, right. never got a competitive Oscar in his lifetime. Yeah. He, at the end of his life, they gave him an honorary Oscar uh -huh. and he gave the best acceptance speech ever. I can't do it justice because it was all in the timing. Mm -hmm. He just stood at the microphone, uh, looked at the audience and said, Thank you. And then walked off the stage. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. That's it. Although I heard that, you know, we, we now know that he might have been a Hitchcock might have been a giant cock. Um, if you've seen <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, the follow up with what what was the woman's name that played it, for it was a Tippy Hedren? Tippy Hedren. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In her I, I the Monster Palooza and uh, I met Tippy Hedren. I was like so in awe to meet yeah. some yeah. kind of heroine. And what a beautiful, elegant, lovely lady she still is. Yeah, and a great uh, um, uh, advocate for animal rights. Oh, is she? Life. I'm not surprised. Life. Yeah. And Give actually, that, Frank, movie, I love your cat. That, oh, is, is, she just threw up, by the way. But. Jason, okay, so that's why Frank left the screen for a few yes. seconds, and that's why he was asking you about, like, what we were talking about, because right. Millie's been sick, but he took her to the vet. This is just a, a, a little follow-up, and she's fine, and she's finally facing the camera, everybody. Well, I, was, I was about to say that Tippi Hedren did a movie called Roar with her husband at the time, and they... That he was like a kind of a crazy animal advocate mm -hmm. and he believed in like we should interact with lions and tigers 
and they went and they filmed all these things with with real tigers and stuff or lions or whatever and uh everyone involved in the movie was seriously injured uh melanie griffith uh wow. her daughter had like half of the top of her head scratched off oh my god you know yeah. what this sounds like the tiger king all right Sounds yeah, like I, didn't, I didn't watch the Tiger King, but Roar is a movie you can find, and it's 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 a really fascinating uh, thing to watch. I think that's on Amazon Prime, or, or uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's around for sure. Oh, it is. I didn't even. Oh, I have to see it. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. She is amazing, and Alfred Hitchcock, despite all the rumors or not rumors, but uh, I'm sure he she's telling the truth. He was a cock, but he was a brilliant uh, horror filmmaker. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, probably an impetus for Stephen King, who's my favorite, especially as Frank mentioned, um, Misery is one of my favorite of all time. I felt like that for the past four years. What do you all have amnesia when Trump was fucking president, actually? You know, that's how I felt the whole time. We were talking about politics, Simon, right before a little bit. I was asking you about the climate there with COVID and... Uh, yeah, I, I was saying that um, in Downing Street at the moment, we have a Trump clone um, called oh, uh, Boris. Boris Johnson, yeah. Uh -huh. He's an impersonator. He's a Trump impersonator, but he hasn't quite got the gumption or the guts. So, um, yeah, a lot of the stuff where he's being told to do, he's not doing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Although everybody, a lot of people here have been double jabbed now. And people say to me, you know, double jabbed. I love it. That sounds that sounds like somebody's been stabbed twice. That's great. Have you, have you been double pricked? And, and <laughs> yeah, that's Trump you... and Boris Johnson. Double. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I say, yeah, being double pricked has made me obviously way more in intelligent. Uh, my IQ has gone up loads and um, I'm much more good looking. I get hit. <laughs> by, I was going to say both genders, but that would be wrong. These the entire rainbow of genre of John gender um and even dogs and cats in the street um i don't know if it's affected my pheromones the uh the pfizer's <laughs> they made them more attractive or if it's just generally it is kind of done something to my bone structure so i, I say to everybody go and go and get double pricked you look so, younger you look definitely look younger i think it does make you look younger i think it's one of the side effects yeah it makes you look younger I'm more handsome. Um, I'm getting more jobs as well. Yeah. <laughs> and you're alive. It makes you more alive. How's that? Yeah. The, the, yeah. Side effect, the side effect that I like is that you don't fucking die of COVID. I, yeah, I'm... exactly. That's it. You live. Yeah, I, heard a great, I heard a great quote today um, that if you're, afraid, if you're afraid of the vaccine of still getting COVID, you can still get COVID. It's not going to kill you. But it's like seatbelts will not prevent car accidents, but they'll keep you a lot safer if you get right. in a car accident. But you heard, did you know who said that quote? Who? O.J. Simpson said that today oh my on God. Twitter. He <laughs> wow. um, advocating wow. for the vaccine. He had his, his seatbelt on the whole Bronco ride, right? <laughs> yeah, he did. Head. He advocates yes, he for the vaccine. Uh, he just doesn't advocate for human life. Um, I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> That's what we say. Uh, but no, the <laughs> vaccine is very important. It is. And we have a lot of people that are resistant here. They do not want to get vaccinated because they are conspiracy theorists and they really truly believe. And I, I was doing stand up in Long Island and some of the comics were talking about this on stage in an, an arena that will only work on Long Island, talking about how the vaccine is going to kill you in two years. And I'm wondering, do you have this crazy um conspiracy uh theorist just do you have these conspiracy theories flying in the in where you are in your area your part in the uk yeah uh, yeah UK, yeah that's as over over here as you have over there can we say that these days probably not um but i just did so apologies <laughs> um I don't know what I can say anymore. I'm old, you can Irene. Say whatever oh. you want for the God. It's Frank and Irene. Are you kidding me? We say yeah. whatever the hell we want. Yeah, we we just end up we cancel ourselves eventually. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, Frank, I can't even get canceled because no one knows I'm alive. So you yeah. can't cancel what's already invisible. But yes, Frank, you're always <laughs> fucking treading shark-filled waters with your mouth. Mm. Okay. Um, well, I've been banned all over the place already, anyway. So. 
That's right. He has a uh, the badge of honor is Facebook because uh, you know Facebook guy I, was banned. Yeah, I was banned from Sirius XM Radio. That's right. Uh, um, uh, a couple of other podcasts, you know. Which, oh, really? I didn't even know about really? the other podcasts you're holding back. No, uh, the David Feldman show. I'm not welcome on, and I'm not welcome. Oh, you, on no, the stop. It's true. And I'm, not, I'm not welcome on the Jimmy Dore show either. What What is wrong wow. with you? Always welcome with Irene Bremis, okay. God damn it! I'll always take you open arm. What the hell is wrong with Mr. Feldman? I don't know. You'd have to uh, ask him, but uh, I could tell you, but it's it's not what we want to. But you'd about. have to kill me. This is this is like too much we're Egypt. having. We don't want to get into all that. We don't want to. We we're not going to derail the conversation. We're going to stick to what's really friendly and okay. um and and enjoyable. Talking I'm about COVID and horror. Yeah, horror is what's enjoyable here. I had to go tap in hand recently to um, a podcast pr a producer because um, one of the TV series I did for Amazon um, is produced by a couple of teachers, and one of them is a Catholic school teacher. And we went on the podcast, and we were very open, and there was bad language and everything else, and his students found it. I mean, like five years later, his students found this, and then the school found out about it, and they gave him such a hard time. And we're threatening to sack him. So I had to go cap in hand to this producer and say, would you mind just, it's awfully, if would you mind just taking that episode out? Would, would that be okay? Could you do that for him? And he, he did. It was Jimmy Starr? Jimmy Starr? Freddy's, no, Jimmy Starr. Yeah, Jimmy Starr. Anyway, he did. thankfully he, uh, he removed the episode for us. Mm -hmm. So... Good. Well, I mean, That's you nice. must have some real charisma, which you do clearly, and the, the allure of you, Simon, to get a producer to do the... The allure. The allure. You didn't show him your gash? I mean, how did you get this done? <laughs> well, it's a shame, you know, it's a shame. I got all these visual gags set up, mm -hmm. so it's a shame. I, um, this is a podcast in audio only, so I'm going to describe what I'm doing now. But I had this, so I've got friends in LA. So um, Ashley Lawrence, who played Kirst, the lovely Kirsty in the Hellraiser films, we are still very good friends. And she was saying to me, oh, if you're gonna do podcasts, you need to get one of these things, which is one of these round lights. You see, one of those things. Oh, wow. So I got that because I thought, well, if that's what they're doing in LA, that's what I'm made to do. But what she didn't tell, gosh, that's bright. Let me turn it down. Um, you have smaller where, ones. Oh, yeah. Where do you put it? Because if it's yeah, there, it, it, if it's you should, there, you should get a stand okay. for it. Lights, but I can't see any of so you. You're lighting yourself, but it does look. Um, <laughs> it's. I don't think like, you really need it. See, Frank and I have natural beauty. Uh, we, don't, we don't need any of these fucking frills, you guys. Look at us. We're stunning right. as is, right, Frank? <laughs> we're we're. Uh, our lighting is uh, one step away from being in the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> You just need, actually, Irene, you just need the um, the tape measure behind you. And that the blue wall is the, the right color. So yeah, I, I wear I do the have the blue wall behind me. I do have the blue wall behind me. And it, uh, it makes me happy, even though I feel like it needs to be a little more bright. You know, it's hard when you're on Zoom doing these podcasts, and sometimes you forget because we're so visually stimulated that it's a podcast so then you have to go into deep descriptions otherwise it doesn't work people, for people I, I thought people could watch this on youtube though can't they yeah they can watch it on youtube they absolutely can but if you're listening to it on uh we're on uh iheart radio app, um apple podcast itunes and wherever pods live obviously you can't see it but yes yes please is go that, to is that why you don't have any pictures on your wall out. it's amazing is that why you don't have any pictures on your wall because um, it's audio um, no, I don't have any pictures on my walls because I don't, um, I don't have any vision these days. That's it. I've been sort of like, uh, just, uh, I need, I don't need any stimulation in my room. I just need to be in a coma, you know, and sort of clear my head. That's why I, I see that you're now when we're Jason just asked me this question. I see that you've got a lot of little like, um, action figures, almost like I'm, a I'm, I'm well, look, my wife used to work at Barnes and Noble. Yeah. So I used to get free Funko Pops and cheap Funko oh. Pops. So anyone that had to do with a horror film or something I grew up with, they're, they're you know, I got Weird Al, Alice Cooper, oh, right. Bob Weird Ross. Al. I say this as a, as a, in a completely <laughs> positive way, your, your room is very geeky. 
And that's a great. <laughs> I'm such a geek. Yeah, those are Tom all. Servo and Crow up there. Yeah, there there can't be enough geeks in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Yep, and Thank I love you. those little action figures. I have them at home too in my childhood bedroom, not in this bedroom because Steve is uh, ruining it for me. That's why I got to get him in the next bedroom. But I, I have bet. action figures, but they're all blow up action figures. <laughs> <laughs> you recognize this? Oh. Okay, so he's holding oh, uh, Bullwinkle, right? Bullwinkle. World. We got to talk about it or else. Sorry, folks. Park's closed. The Moose South Front should have told you. No. Nice. Oh, is that Wally a World. Wally World. Jason? Marty Moose. Oh, it's Marty Moose? Oh, from uh, from the right. vacation film, right? Vacation film, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm failing this test. This and and the, a... the thing on the other side of you, Jason, is that a Luke tube? I'm sorry? <laughs> He's. He's a star. He's a star. Oh, on this. this is a microphone. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's a microphone. A Simon. Calm down. Okay. I don't it's know if you've ever seen any of these in the remote area that you're leaving, living in. And um, it's where are you? Are. You're, where are you again? We discussed this. I'm in Lincolnshire, which Lincolnshire. is where Robin Hood lived or lived. Right. Yes, okay. not far from Sherwood Forest. So are you in like a very, is that like a very rural kind of area? Yeah, it's one of the most rural areas of England. Um, obviously oh, that Scotland. sounds, that sounds, because I've been to London, which I love, but I've always wanted to explore the other parts of England, which I, I hope to do one day. But I, you know, I have this image of, uh, I was just watching the movie uh, um, Anne of the Thousand Days last night, you know, which is about Henry VIII with Richard Burton and, uh -huh. I, always love all the, I always love all that English countryside when I see in those kinds of movies. It's so yeah, gorgeous. it's so pretty. It has to be really gorgeous there, right? Now, what is Lincolnshire mostly, uh, outside of Robin Hood, is there anything else that's like uh, uh, an attraction there? Other than um, Simon? Other than me. There's a place called the Lincolnshire Walds, W-O-L-D-S. And that's a kind of rolling area. It also has a coastline. Um, with a really cheesy resort called Skegness on it, which is um, it's a bit like, it's kind of a poor man's version of Atlantic City. Wow, I oh. thought Atlantic City was a poor man's version of Atlantic City. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we have four versions of Atlantic City. <laughs> now you're banned from Atlantic City Radio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did mention it in Atlantic City. We liked it. We went on the boardwalk every day and, uh, and, and walked. Oh, and, the New Jersey Horror Con, right? That's the one, yeah, that's right. It was fun. Now, the New Jersey, New Jersey, Horror, New Jersey Horror Con, I thought that was just called New Jersey. <laughs> they are to be more specific. Um, Jason, you, you go to these horror cons all the time, right? Look at my room. Yeah, you yes. do all the time. Now, are there, yeah. like, when is the next horror con? Let people know, like, when the next. Well, I'm not, I'm not making any money from it. So, um, no, it's. Yeah. Because I want to go. You know, yeah, you should come. Um, well, I, I wanted to go to the last one that you went to, to Carmen Lynch and you invited Frank too, but thank God neither we of us. We did invite you, us. just so you know. We yeah, did but, invite but thank God you. we didn't go because it was actually not even open, right? It was right, it was online. virtual. They said it was going on, so we went, yeah. but they yeah. never said it was virtual. Oh, and they didn't have it. it yeah. You know, they that had the roads that blocked theater, off. That theater where they filmed The Blob, I, Trace, well, you and I have done like at least four shows there already. That's one of our, oh. one of our um, go to That's when we were doing cool live theater. shows. Yeah. Yeah, we saw Joel Hodgson do his one man show there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Phoenix. that's a beautiful theater. That's like a really beautiful theater. So they, uh, I want to go to one of the horror cons. And if Simon, if you're ever going to be in August 13th to the. I'm going August 15th, Sunday, the one in Cherry Hill that I met Simon at. Oh, yeah, I haven't done that one for a while. Was that Days of the Dead or uh, Monster Mania? Monster Mania. Monster Mania. They're having a the, 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 play, the, monster, play night the monster conventions, they don't have to tell people to mask up before they go, right? They, they're just all going to be wearing <laughs> They're all getting, they all have masks on. Yeah. Michael Berryman, they got. Oh, wow. These Amanda Beers from Married with Children, Chris Sarandon, Pete Ulrich, Matthew Lillard, Marty Cove, and William Zabka from um, Karate Kid and that new show. Wow. Why can't I think of it? 
Well, Simon, you have to keep us posted when you come back here. Yeah. I, would I, was, love supposed to. Doing, I was supposed to be doing Las Vegas, Days of the Dead in Las Vegas um, last March. And literally the day before I flew out, they, they shut everything down. So I'm hoping that comes up because I've never been to Vegas. So that would be quite a fun oh, one. Oh, that'll be a blast. Yeah. That would be amazing. Okay, so guys, we are running a little out of time. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody talks about uh, what they're working on, upcoming movies without any spoilers. Mr. Simon Bamford, <laughs> tell everybody where they can find you and what you're working on. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, Dark Ditties is a series on Amazon Prime. Episodes one to four are up now. I'm also an, a producer on that, so that's fun. But I, I play lots of different characters, including the 95-year-old, 85-year-old lady. Um, it's an anthology series, but everything is tied together. We've finished episode five, and that's due out in the next month, which is cool. That's set in the future. Um, that's called Dad. That's also part of the Dark Ditties. And then we're going into production on the last of the, the, the series finale, um soon um mosaic should be coming out next year which is a film where i played the policeman which i was talking about um the haunting of margam castle has just come out and i think that's available on streaming services um then i've got a lgbt film that i did called um called you are my sunshine which is due out um, again, some, everything's due out at once because of COVID. Everybody, everybody's suddenly kind of madly doing post-production work on stuff. So that is also due out soon. Um, and I play um, um, bigoted 70s father in that. And um, 14 Ghosts, which is something that I, I did my first film on a Zoom call, which was, so that, that is an LA production, but I, my character was on a Zoom call. So I did it here in this background, actually. Nice. So. So um, I don't know if, when that's due out. Um, I think that's everything. Wow, and you think that's everything. That's a lot. Well, Jesus, COVID has been good for you, huh? Look at you, you've been working your ass off. So that's a lot. I'm happy to see that you're working so much. And uh, are you um, on Twitter or any of the uh, social media yeah. stuff? So, um, you can do me a great favor and look me up on IMDb, which will help my star rating, which is a very, very fickle thing that actors some actors are and shouldn't be are obsessed with <laughs> leaving me. Um, so if you mind going to IMDb, um, and if I could just say, and if you could put Alexa, who is Simon Bamford? And if you could play that out for everybody listening, that would do me the world of good. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and, and yes, so I'm at Simon Bamford on Twitter, and um, I think I'm Simon Bamford one on Facebook. On Facebook and Instagram. Are you on Instagram? It's no, I'm not. I'm not on Instagram. I missed the boat. Ashley Lawrence said I should go on it, and I went on it, and I just that was too. I was too lazy to do. I was too too many streaming things. I need a life. It's it's just it's it's a lot. It's 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 a you know it's a d d o c d. But anyway, you've got a lot going on. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, it was such a you. pleasure. It was a thank blast to meet you. So much fun. Amazing to meet you. Thank you so much. And Jason, sweet boy, what, what's going on in the world of Mr. Jason Pollock? How can I top what Simon said? Uh, um, but <laughs> tomorrow true. night on the Hi, I'm Jason podcast, we have, we took a break from these celebrities and artists. We're, we're talking to an astrobiology, professor of astrobiology, and she works for NASA. Um, her name's Karen Meach. I saw her do a TED talk and I found it really interesting. She's an expert on astrobiology and she's going to talk to us about comets and meteors and interstellar life. And mm. wow. we're going to geek it out tomorrow. Wow, that's amazing. I want to, I want to hear about that. That's incredible. I, I, that's at seven o'clock tomorrow. Okay, seven o'clock tomorrow on um... Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube. Okay, Live. awesome. And uh, Frank, Mr. Frank Connick. Um, my thing that I've got coming up is uh, Tuesday. Um, uh, August 10th. Um, so if this airs after that, be sure to go back in time to, uh, to hear all about this. But uh, Tuesday, August 10th, Trace Bilyeu and I are doing our next uh, live streaming movie riffing show. Um, we're doing a movie called The Beach Girls and the Monster, and it's every bit as good as it sounds. <laughs> it's $10, and you can, you can watch it live or watch a download later. 
and it's going to be really fun. It is going to be really fun. And you, if you haven't seen these guys in action, you need to check it out. They're so fun. And I will just post whatever the hell I'm working on on Twitter at Irene Bremis on Instagram. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much for being part thanks, of this thanks, show. Thanks. And, um, and we'll be back next week with a new guest. And we're going to keep you guessing because I'm, I don't know who the new guest is going to be. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining, guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Mother May I podcast with Frank and Irene on Strong Island Entertainment. Check us out next week when Frank and Irene sit down with, you know what? I don't know what these two are going to do next, but we'll see you next week.